Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar, 40 Days of Mayhem, uh, discussing the ongoing saga of vulnerabilities, exploits, and mitigations for the Ivanti Connect Secure and Ivanti um, Policy Secure Gateways. It's an issue that uh, emerged our consciousness in uh, January, January the 10th of this year. And um, it's, uh, it's an issue that doesn't seem to be going away just yet. Uh, and so we thought it was worthwhile to bring some of our experts together uh, to share some time with you and uh, give you our clients and um, other uh, interested people in the community an opportunity just to have a chat with us about the issue, um, what it is, how we discover it, how we detect it, uh, and how we mitigate it in uh, in our environments. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, this is more or less the agenda that we want to uh, follow this morning, this, this afternoon here where I am. Uh, so we want to start by taking just a few minutes to kind of jog you through the, the, the big picture. What is the vulnerability? How does it work? Um, how do we find it? How do we mitigate it? Uh, and what, you know, sort of cutting through some of the cruff to present you with a clear picture of uh, what the issue is as we stand today. Uh, then we want to take some time to... Um, to share with you the, the research that we contributed um, to the story, in particular, a, a persistence mechanism, a backdoor that we refer to as the DSL log backdoor. Um, and, uh, and Scott will be joining us, will talk us through that and explain uh, you know, what it is and uh, how it impacts you. I'm gonna ask you if, if you don't share with us um, very briefly, just some of your own experience interested to hear from you uh, with a very short poll, just you know whether and how you've been impacted by the incident. And then uh, finally, and most importantly, we want to go to a kind of an ask me anything session. So the idea there is that um, there's a questions feature available in the webinar interface uh, that you type your questions for us there. And I'm going to do my best to interpret those questions and uh, pass them through to the different uh, panelists that we have joining uh, joining us today. Uh, and the hope is that we can get through as many of, of your specific questions as we as we possibly can. Uh, I've got a lot of questions of my own, I know, but um, this, uh, the time, the second half of the webinar is, uh, is really gonna be an opportunity for you to interrogate us. Uh, and to that end, I'm, I'm joined by a, a panel of, of diverse experts who have been really working on the cold uh, on the cold face of this incident since it since it's broke. So these are people who are, who are hands on dealing with the problem, responding to uh, compromises, trying to understand the vulnerability, etc. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to to introduce them to you. Uh, first up is uh, is an old friend and colleague of mine, Vickers Ross. Uh, Vikas joins us also from uh, hi Vikas. Vikas joins us also from Cape Town in South Africa, where uh, where I am. Um, Vikas is a security professional, security researcher on my team, um, and he's been tracking this issue uh, at a high level in order to communicate as clearly and as uh, conscientiously as we can to to the community. Um, after Vikas, we have Scott Walker. Um, Scott heads up our computer security uh, incident response team in the UK. So these are the guys that you phone uh, when the proverbial paw paw hits the fan. Um, Scott has been running from client to client, helping them understand uh, whether they've been compromised, how they've been compromised, what it means for them and how best to respond. Uh, Scott's also uh, been directly involved in the discovery and documentation of that DSL backdoor that we spoke about earlier. And uh, Scott's slightly uh, more attractive uh, French cousin uh, is Robinson Delaguerre. Uh, Robinson joins us uh, from France. Uh, he's been with the business, I think, for as long as there's been a business in Orange Cyber Defense, more or less. And he heads up our CSIRT team in uh, France. So 
Robin's not only specifically involved with this issue, but also comes to us with decades of experience uh, supporting customers who experience these kinds of issues. And then finally, we have uh, Wilfried Pascal. Uh, Wilfried heads up our uh, vulnerability intelligence unit in France, a service we offer called Vulnerability Watch. Uh, and they specifically analyze vulnerabilities, uh, understand the implications, just understand how they're being exploited, et cetera. Um, so all, all of you, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, we have to talk a little bit about our style book. I can see some of us are a little off uh, corporate style because you're going to have to grow a beard. Uh, Scott, you're going to have to get glasses. And Wilfried, you're going to have to get a beard and glasses, uh, I'm afraid. Good. So having said that, thank you uh, to, my, to, to, to my colleagues, the, the panelists for joining us. And thank you to the rest of you who uh, have joined us from wherever you are. We appreciate you are busy uh, and we hope to make the session as worthwhile for you as we as we possibly can. Um, I want to take a moment uh, before we start though, if I may, um, to talk about a question that comes up a lot um, and to just to share a position on it. And the question is, should we be dropping Ivanti for a different vendor or a different uh, product? And what I want to say about this is, is the following. Firstly, full disclosure uh, right up front, we, uh, we are a big partner of Ivanti's. Uh, we have a very healthy uh, functional partnership with them, and we have had for several years. Uh, and we do about everything with them that an integrator can do. We sell their products. We support them for our clients. We manage them on an ongoing basis. We use them in our managed services. We use them uh, as a business ourselves. Do that on a on a significant scale, um, and this is of course not the first time we've had to manage vulnerabilities in Avanti. As, as you can see from the screenshot uh, that should be showing now, in, back in 2021 in our annual security report, we we documented the evolution of a set, set of vulnerabilities uh, in what at that time was called Pulse or Pulse Secure, they later got bought by Avanti and it became Avanti. But it was uh, really the same set of technologies and um, a vulnerability, serious vulnerability was discovered in Pulse uh, and that crept uh, out into more vulnerabilities in Pulse and then similar vulnerabilities in different products and other vulnerabilities in different products. And there was this whole kind of tsunami of uh, vulnerabilities, exploits and compromises associated with uh, these kinds of products. So this is this is not an entirely uh, new thing for us, and it's not something that's isolated um, or unique to Imanti. It is, of course, of real concern to us. This is this latest vulnerability is is big in terms of exploitability, in terms of its scope, and that's a concern to us. Our approach is to leverage that partner that partnership with Imanti and our other partners. Um, to really have a broad conversation around how collectively we can engineer an environment in which the products that we as a vendor, as an integrator, sell and manage uh, meet our requirements and meet our customers' requirements for uh, security, but security in the broader sense of the word. And by that, I mean um, uh, not just uh, a low count of CVEs. And I think it's easy to reduce these issues to, you know, how many CVEs do we report for a vendor? Security is a much broader issue than that. And we need to look at a number of uh, specific and environmental factors. And uh, our approach is to, is, to, is to use our partnerships to have that conversation with, the, uh, with our vendors. Um, so we don't think that this time, right now, is the right time for us or for our clients to make uh, rash decisions about vendors or products. Uh, we think our first priority now must be to manage the specific acute threat at hand um, and to get ready for what history predicts will be a wave of similar vulnerabilities and exploits, maybe in Avanti, maybe in other vendors. Um, and we think that for us and for you to make a decision about which vendors you trust and want to build with uh, is a decision that needs to be make, made with care. Um, it's a decision that needs to be made with the right mindset, and it should be made with a, with a, with a clear understanding 
of what defines security uh, for you. It's a decision that's going to affect not just your architectural choices, but also your, um, so not just your product choices, but also your architectural choices. So, so we're cautioning care, we're saying slow down, uh, don't make knee-jerk decisions, take your, take your time, think carefully and think long-term about uh, what products and architectures are going to serve your business uh, going into the future. Uh, so having said that, this webinar specifically uh, is going to focus on the issues impacting Ivanti now. We're going to talk about uh, how we discover the vulnerability on the devices we own, uh, how we detect and do attacks, um, and, and how we recover from incidents, how we prepare for the next, um, you know, the, 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 the next incident of this kind that will inevitably follow sooner or, or later. Um, this is not going to be a space uh, to compare vendors. We're not going to um, engage in vendor shaming. Uh, we won't have the time and we don't have the people on this call to, um, to address those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of questions. So I hope that is clear to everyone. Um, having said that, I am very pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Vickers. Uh, as I said, he's been tracking this issue uh, very closely since it, since it broke. Uh, and he volunteered to present us with a kind of a summary of uh, what happened and where we stand now. Thanks, Vickers. Thank you, Shaul. Uh, yeah, and uh, you, you alluded to, 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 this, uh, to this section um, in, in the fact that it was quite a, a busy time for our, for our CERT and our CSIT uh, and everybody in the organization as well as for, for those impacted with this. Uh, in short, there were, over the last couple of weeks, we were uh, you know, sharing information about the, the specific vulnerabilities uh, as well as the mitigations that were available. Uh, but on the back of that, or actually preceding that, were also the information that various vendors published on active exploitation of these, especially the first two set of vulnerabilities that uh, broke news in early, in early uh, January about uh, being exploited. Uh, by uh, which they attributed to govern, govern, government linked or as some would call it nation state hackers. Um, and this this actually set the scene for quite a lot of mayhem as our title screen alluded to. Uh, like I said, it started in the early, middle, early January of this year uh, and then rapidly proceeded uh, for a couple of weeks up until February 14th, uh, where the last set of patches were released. Now, in between a lot of um, things happened, a lot of information got published, and a lot of questions were asked about, you know, are we vulnerable, what do we need to do and protect, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it was clear from the beginning that the impact was, you know, quite wide and broad, especially if, if you were running spe specific versions of Ivanti's products. Um, and initially, the the thought were that it was targeted attacks that uh, specific because it was nation state attributed that you know only a handful of you know picked uh, targets were, were in scope but then as vendors started poking at this and this is where your cascade effect talks to show was that people realized something was up and then people start peeling away at this this multifaceted vulnerabilities uh, and realized that you know there's more to it meets the eye, and it, this happened in quite quick succession. Um, in 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 a couple of days after the initial uh, publication, uh, in, uh, Watchtower, Rapid Seven, and the likes, they already started uh, sharing information about how and what, etc. And this quickly uh, drove more and more people to look into this vulnerability. By the end of the month of January, uh, several uh, detected instances were already discovered uh, of these products of Ivanti and from our initial assessment also you know people were already exploiting these things um, and actually doing you know as you would expect from the crypto miner in uh, malware guys trying to, to, to load up anything they can on, on there so it quickly went from targeted attacks to just full-on wildfire um, and as I was saying that certain various versions of the products were impacted all the way through from the you know the, the classic connect secure or the pulse the secure versions of the the product uh, listing there quite a lot of numbers uh, based on what was published on Ivanti's website 
Um, Ivanti also uh, provided us with a tool called the Integrity Checker tool, so that we can detect anomalies um, and just diagnose certain, you know, system states. Not ideally a forensics tool, but it really was used to at least point people in the direction that something might be up because the attackers actually modified content on the device. They actually tried to even they went as far as modifying the uh, the ICT tool. Uh, that spurred a, or that prompted Ivanti to publish a new version of it or an external version of it, uh, which they recently updated this week now to be able to dump a snapshot of the uh, device being scanned. Um, now we're not 100% sure about the, the extent to which this uh, dump is up, uh, the, that this dump can be used. Uh, I'll allow my colleagues in the CSET and the CERT to, to to answer that questions, but. They do seem, Avanti do seem to have, you know, responded to uh, the industry asking for more visibility into these devices, uh, you know, especially from a post-compromise point of view. And it is actually quite something that's uh, not easy to to detect uh, yourself unless you know where to look and you spend some time with it. Uh, but ultimately, also network analysis or network traffic analysis was necessary to detect, you know, anomalies coming in and out of these devices uh, for post-compromise because once the the attackers get onto the the device they tend to spread they can spread into the network internally and then use that as a permit further uh, from there um, log monitoring is also something that it was shown to be uh, difficult in the beginning uh, and people learned quickly to try and leverage those logs to actually understand what's going on in the device and so forth um, especially for unauthenticated requests uh, that uh, with the granularity in there was sometimes a, a challenge to to get right but you know this speaks to the broader more broader theme of defense and depth which I'll touch on a bit later um, but then coming into the specifics of the vulnerabilities themselves five vulnerabilities were disclosed over the course of those uh, uh, 40 days if you will um, you know, when I looked at them myself, uh, you know, if you're a if you're an ethical hacker or or you know a pen tester or anybody just in the in the industry that understands how these vulnerabilities work, is it was quite interesting to see these scale these types of vulnerabilities uh, because you know for for anybody that plays in this type of space, myself, you know, you you, you sometimes uh, get excited when you look at these things and you, you try to understand how they work and when when you do. You, you know, light bulbs goes on and you start understanding the potential and the possibilities and then you see why these things have the CVSS ratings they do, but also you start thinking about what other things I can do with this uh, as an attacker. The first two being the zero days announced on uh, the 10th of January uh, were quite interesting, especially the fact that you could chain them together and then ultimately being able to bypass the authentication and then run a command uh, on the actual compromised device. You'll see the the paths there uh, that were published about how to get through this uh, RESTful API uh, and purely by manipulating the contents of those uh, URIs, um, you could actually then actually get the device, the underlying web application to execute these commands for you and then inject whatever you wanted on there. A shell to you know, perform a, a, or execute code, so it creates a reverse connection for you and you can then uh, interact with the device as a as whatever route, as whatever user that uh, service was running under. My personal favorite, if I have to choose, with the was the the ones that disclosed on the end of December, end of January, right? Uh, that was specifically the server side request forgery one in the SAML, and and the way that was hidden uh, was actually quite interesting. If you if you know how this XML, because it's an XML document that you had to manipulate a certain value. Uh, in, and then you could then trigger that value to also to cause an execution. And some guys were actually quite clever and you start thinking, seeing how, how these attackers think about chaining these things together to actually then, the one using another vulnerability, the 21887 one, you can actually then do a similar uh, code execution on it. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to see how these, these, these attackers went about them. Um, and it's all about invoking those web uh, endpoints. So it's, a, it's basically a URL, a web endpoint, and then you're posting data to that web point. So that's why it was so straightforward and trivial because almost anybody with a browser could, could have 
you know, interacted with these vulnerabilities at some level. Or even just if you have a command line tool, um, you could actually just use that command line tool and then interact with these vulnerabilities. Now, there were the, these vulnerabilities were, and then um, not the only ones, there was the other two as well that uh, came came off the cuff of that. Uh, it's uh, the second, well, there's the first one listed there, the 22024, the XML external entity one, which is quite, a, if you look at it right at the exploit level, the proof of concept level, looks very similar to the previous one, the SOMOLS uh, uh, SSRF one, in the way that you put content in a field in an XML document and you post it and then the device uh, or the service executes that and then you can then connect back to it. So it's a classical, typical web-based uh, vulnerabilities for, for each class, nothing new, nothing fancy, uh, run-of-the-mill stuff. Um, and all of these vulnerabilities were patched up until at the, by the end of 14th of Feb, or Ivanti published uh, fixes for all of them. But those that didn't uh, patch or didn't opt to roll out those uh, patches could actually use the XML, mit uh, this mitigation file that you could run to actually block that. Uh, execution of those endpoints, but that also recall, required you then to sacrifice some functionality. For example, the SAML uh, functionality, if you were dependent on SSO, then that would have fallen on the wayside, but at least the, the endpoint wasn't exposed for exploitation. So I, I mentioned the remediation side already on the, on, the, on the mitigation, but also ultimately, you know, fixes with, deploying the fixes with the ultimate way of solving this headache, right, getting away from from this uh, this threat, uh, the deploying of the fixes did require um, several steps. Uh, Ivanti did publish a bunch of steps for depending on what type of uh, device you're running. If it's a virtual appliance or physical appliance, ultimately it boiled down to if it's a physical device, you need to do a factory reset and then deploy all the patches and, and follow their guidance on their virtual appliances do require, uh, I recall, a re rebuild, basically. I mean, they don't recommend a, um, I speak on the correction now, they don't re require your factory re uh, reset, but just a rebuild of the virtual plant. Because it's virtual, you can just scrap it and start from scratch again. But ultimately, I think this, this scenario, this incident also rekindled, I think, for many, the you know, how do you protect your perimeter, especially when it is a device that allows external access to the, let's say, internal network. And it comes back to that old question about your defense in depth, you know, strategy. And if, Shashal also mentioned that in, in, in his opening statement uh, before I, I came on about rethinking the way that you actually treat your environment. How do you protect your environment and actually what do you do to uh, limit that blast radius. And, you know, it comes back to that, if you look at the cyber, the NIST cyber frame, framework, which they recently announced an update for, uh, identify, protect, detect, response, and recover. And now there's a new one, I think, called governing there as well. But I've ultimately logging, uh, monitoring, uh, and as well as, you know, just access control management and how your users are authenticated to your network. Do you know whether or not you know you can revoke that access actually do you have enough mfa or pass keys you want to go to the next level of that but ultimately monitoring your network um, is becoming really important and if you detect anomalies you'll be able to respond and recover from that uh, those those classical ideas don't go away they're actually something that we need to reinforce in this um, but ultimately we need to understand where we are uh, with our you know, capabilities, what do we lack? And we can't just, con I can say, uh, depend on solely one control to protect you, right? If one control gets compromised and the attacker spills into your network, you know, you, you, you really need to go beyond just that one perimeter device and actually enforce other more layered approaches. And even if you can't be able to detect the anomalies and then respond, I think is, is key here, Joel. Because thanks. Can, can I ask you just to just to hang on there? Because I, I wanna I wanna try and reflect back to you uh, some of what I'm hearing you say and make sure that I that I understand this. Um, so these two products, 
connect secure and uh, connect uh, what is it Pol policy secure or something Sorry, yeah i, I think there was a Z, there was a zta uh, for gateways as well if i recall there were three three versions GTA for gateways three products. Yeah. yeah um they are perimeter they're perimeter appliances they yeah. they facilitate secure remote, access. secure remote access and they do it using ssl vpns which means I've, that they're effectively exposing a web service is that is that correct the connect secure definitely i know that i'm not 100 percent sure about the other two um i'm i'm i i mean my colleagues can correct me on that but i definitely know that connect secure is the one that does ssl vp and the other two might be uh, exposed in different ways and their roles might be slightly different than the okay. connect secure but the the vulnerabilities that we're seeing exploited are are basically triggered using http request yes on on the serve, on ports that's exposed that's uh, accessible the, on the to field. the internet yeah you can't fire them or you can't you can't filter them off you can't put them behind a firewall you can't um, turn it off because then effectively your appliance isn't working so in some cases you can that's what that uh, mitigation file what they call the xml mitigation files per, uh, purpose was initially before the patches were not available to actually to allow that as like a denial list on those endpoints on the actual physical devices uh, but in the case for example on saml if you if you that saml endpoints if you do that then your ssos might not work or your your um, authentication process could fail uh, because you were denying that functionality so it did impact certain people based on the, the functionalities they were using or, or relying on so in effect it does neuter it so if you were hard filtering that yourself for whatever technology or mechanism you did you rendered that device to some degree um, not not uh, you, you would affect its operation you would affect its operation yeah right. yeah yeah so so th so these exploits are remote over the services are exposed directly um, and they're triggered using simple HTTP requests so so like very easy to automate to script to absolutely yeah. uh, to copy to change to, to understand correct and as uh, my colleagues will probably attest to when they speak to it it was really like chaining this together and just you know point and click type thing it was nothing nothing um too challenging nothing difficult about it yeah okay um and then we spoke about five vulnerabilities each with a an assigned cve they're being mm -hmm. used in the exploits uh some more than others it sounds to me uh, and some together with with others um are there any of those vulnerabilities that aren't involved in the exploit chain anywhere of the five um, that you mentioned i think of the five the last the one the one that was released last was more a i think that uh, cv 20 24 8 that was the one i think ivanti disclosed by themselves now i'm i, I speak under correction and i'm please ask my colleagues to correct me here but that one is one that we haven't seen that frequently the the first two were definitely um if I do go back, yeah, the first two, the uh, 46805 and the 21887, those were definitely in the beginning. But it's almost as if the the SAML one, the service side request forgery one, as well as the XML external entity one, those two, because they were almost like self-contained um, and the, the SSRF SAML one was very easy to do. Um, and, I, and I don't want to steal Scott's and uh, uh, Robinson's Thunder, yeah, but that that was more like a self-contained, like one XML, one message that's being posted to that HTTP endpoint, and it just like opened up the world for you on that inside of that yeah. network. So those so two, see, last two, were definitely more more popular. I see um, uh, Wilfried uh, ping me on the side to say no, actually that last vulnerability is also being exploited in the last. Okay. Uh, uh, in the last few days, there, there is one. Only one. There's only Go one quality not exploited yet. This is a privilege escalation. It's just a simple one that I've been found internally by Ivan T. But yeah, the XXE is 
is still exploiting the wall since a few days now, since February 23. Reported to Ivanti and then Mandiant said the same information to Ivanti the same day. So yeah, it's exploited uh, to dropping the same kind of uh, DS log backdoor and extracting some data. But if you already patch, you, you don't have any issue on that. You're clear. Okay. So I want to ask about the patches then. So five vulnerabilities, is that five patches then? Or is it one patch? Or is it just you take it to a new version and then they're all sorted out? Well, the patches were staggered. I believe they were, because they went at the beginning, at, at the 31st of January is when we received the first tranche of patches. So the Ivanti at that stage released four fixes for the four, uh, for four, CVEs and then the day thereafter was one release for this last privilege escalation vulnerability. But by the 14th of Feb, all uh, versions were fixed. But those patches that Ivanti released were basically a combination. Uh, it was one big patch, and it, was, it wasn't necessarily a staggered patch like one one for each vulnerability. It was an encompassing set of patches. So they the updates they released were for specific versions initially, but then at the end of the day, they released more updates for other versions. Um, so okay. it it was it was kind of like a multi-patch, if you want to call it, but depending on the version you were on, you received specific updates as as the as they were announced. And and right now, if you know if you discover uh, like. My fridge is behind an event. My network connected fridge is behind an uh, Avanti gateway. Do I do I go back and install the the whole history of patches, or do I? Uh, is there just one that I? Uh, well, I don't know exactly that answer. My my, I think the guidance from Avanti is you re do the factory reset and then you re you you follow their guidance in which they actually specified now clearly because I think they updated last week or this week with the clear guidance on don't do a factory reset here or do a factory reset here depending if it's virtual or if it's uh, if it's physical physical requires a factory reset and then you follow their upgrade path which in, which should end with the last set of uh, patches right uh, it's not I'm not 100% sure if it's a roll up of all the patch or if it's just an addition to that I think Wilfred might be able to answer that but the uh, Certain ones they do clear, like in the, in the virtual appliances, you do a re complete rebuild of it. You don't just do a factory reset on that. So read their instructions. Uh, I think the, their official guidance has been updated this week uh, on, on this as well. Okay. Okay. So read their, read their guidance. Um, then I just wanted very briefly, if you could, because it, so there was also the so-called XML mitigation. Um, my understanding of that is that it's basically like a locally enforced block list for certain URLs uh, that that they knew were either vulnerable or being exploited or involved in the exploit chain. Yeah. Um, so it's a denial so the mitigation list. doesn't patch the yeah it's a denial list. The, the the mitigation doesn't patch the issues. The the underlying uh, CGIs are still vulnerable, but should prevent an attacker from reaching those via the by the web in the way we described earlier. Correct. So it's it's more like a sh like a firewall or a shield, you know, that's been put up, and then but the vulnerability is still present on the device. So if they could somehow bypass that that uh, denialist, that they maybe then they could still execute those vulnerabilities. It's still there. You you need to deploy the fixes to be fully protected, uh, and I, as and that is official requirements. Like you know, you don't need the mitigations once you've deployed the 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 patches. Because the fixes, the the fixes that you should is sufficient. All right, and then uh, because I'm just very mindful of uh, of time right now, so I just want to do this very quickly. Then you also mentioned the ICT tool, uh, that's an integrity checker. Its function is basically to confirm that the Ivanti code hasn't been changed. In other words, to detect um, changes to their code, backdoors, uh, new elements that have been dropped on the file system, etc. It doesn't tell you whether you've been uh it doesn't tell you whether you're vulnerable or not and it doesn't um it doesn't patch you right so it's a diagnostic tool to my understanding which they've now recently 
upgraded that the external one they've the Ivanti enhanced to be able to you now also dump the uh, the image or snapshot of that appliance but to your point the tool is an integrity checker so it's merely a a check it goes through a checklist of detecting certain modifications uh, on the device for you know maybe you know anomalies or maybe there's something wrong uh, but it's not it's not something to patch your machine with or your device with because there's a separate process for that and it's not something that you can use necessarily for forensics. It's it's a guide, it's an aid, and it's an extension of that processor tool. But it is something that they've provided as a way to go through a set of steps or aid and make and automate certain things. The the recent update to the external uh, ICT tool uh, was uh, something new, which was which was a surprise to me. Um, but I think the reason also why there's two, which is the internal one and the external one, is because the one on the device got modified or tampered with by the, the attacker. So the external one was more a, a you want to, uh, you know, clean information about it without being, you know, compromised at least uh, from that point. But it's 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 a it's a tool nonetheless that you can use to to help you in in troubleshooting, not necessarily completely, but just to troubleshoot or detect certain anomalies. Okay, excellent. Well, I think let's let's rope Scott in there. Um, Scott, if I could ask uh, you uh, regarding the just be before we talk talk about the back door, uh, because mm -hmm. I think these two things. Um, in fact, why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about the back door first, and then we can go back to the to the ICT tool. So uh, this is a persistence mechanism that you and your team discovered uh, together with our cert. Um, during the course of, of your investigations. So tell us what that's about and, and, and why it matters. Yeah, so the research that we did, um, what we identified, along with others who had identified, you know, different types of campaigns going on, uh, the likes of Alexity and Mandiant who put out there about different web shells and different, um, different back doors being put into the machine. One of the ones that we identified was uh, using um, part of the uh, third and fourth vulnerabilities uh, a server-side forgery request that would send commands that would edit in line existing files uh, and, and um, services on the device. So in this particular one, they're going after the dslog.pem uh, file. That's a log handler uh, for Avanti. So in all these logs we were checking, um, the, the, the service that handles those logs and creates them, that's what they modified to essentially put in a couple of lines that allowed for remote code execution of system. Um, once we identified that, and the key to identifying this sort of stuff is, one, you have to have the technical capability and, and a team, uh, enough analysts to be able to go through that with the right expertise. And then two is a large enough data set to check this across to be able to confirm any um, any findings as being part of a campaign. So luckily we were in a position as on well cyber defense, we had lots of managed devices to go and do this. So we discovered um, these commands being issued to the box, the subsequent file being edited and we're able to pull that out uh, and re uh, produce the blog um, uh, and the technical write-up to be able to put it out to other people to say if you're seeing this this is what it is uh, essentially that's the, the whole point of these uh, technical write-ups is to help the forensic community as a whole um, understand what they're seeing in isolation because uh, i'm very aware you know as an analyst if you're sat uh, and you only have one Avanti device that you're, you, you're investigating, you only have that one set of uh, logs and you, you're sort of confused at a time ago, what am I seeing, um, what are other people seeing, and these sorts of technical write-ups really do help. I think any analyst who's, uh, who's been in it knows at some point during their career they've used a blog to help them do their research or identify what they're looking at at that time. So that was essentially how we produced it and what we produced. So, Scott, um, I, I understand that we, uh, we we got an early um, notification, I guess, of the issue from from Ivanti. Um, yep. It took us about an hour, I think, to get uh, to to notify our um, vulnerability intelligence watch customers, yep. um, and then it, within that same hour, we started uh, we, we launched the, the the action to start patching our our clients. Um, and I understand that you guys responded to, was it like 25 incidents in like five different countries or was it more than that? It's still ongoing. So yeah, the numbers have been up, but <laughs> roughly about that. Yep. Okay. All right. So, and that's what you're talking about, right? So across, you know, once you've looked at 25 compromised devices, you start seeing the, 
the pattern. And in this case, what you discovered was that they were modifying the code of this particular uh, yeah. endpoint, this, this URL, uh, so they would execute commands again for them if they if yeah. they set their user agent string to to this predetermined yeah. value. And and one of the really interesting things, the reason we were able to do it externally as well, is part of the um, a part of editing that that because uh, it was from an attacker's perspective they were just sending blind commands there's no way for them to know is this successful part of that initial mm. part of it was to say write to disk and give me root access and if it if i have got root access and i can write to disk in the uh, in the web server in the danana uh, dash uh, directories they put a file and in this particular case it was index2.txt uh, that was publicly available from external so you could we could go we knew all the ips of avanti boxes that we'd already been dealing with um, including our own managed services but also of any avanti box that was um, discoverable on the internet and we could go search for that indicator of compromise um, once that's how we then knew who to notify and say hey we know as part of uh if you had this indicator of compromise at index2.txt within your denial web page you've been affected by this backdoor not only have they done that They've also done put this back door in, uh, and it was more than likely successful because we know that they were vulnerable at that time also. Right, because this, the entire exploit chain um, is triggered via the web interface. Yeah. And then the web shells are, of course, also exposed via the web interface. So you're talking to them like yeah. you would, as if it is a legitimate web application yeah. running on the event device. And yeah. so these other indicators, like the, the, the marker file, if you like, is. Um, also accessible via the web in face yep. you could literally hit it with your browser yeah absolutely and it's also the way that they did um, a lot of when they were dumping out the system files uh, or the system configs they were just they're just making them they were dumping them out to dot gif files as base64 in some in some instances it was just a file um, and they were pub publicly available you could go and get them so you could go and put your request in to get that uh, that page and it would download the the dumped out system config which is what made it so impactful for, on a on a on a public scale as in anyone could then go and get it not just the threat actor who had initially initiated it scott i want to ask you about the ict tool in that context but i also just want to invite wilfried to he's, yeah. he's also got some insight into this issue um and i want to remind our attendees if you we have a few questions coming in um, but if you have other specific questions, please hit us up and we'll, we'll try and address them for you. Um, Wilfried, before we go to you, I just want to check with you, Scott. So this uh, integrity checker tool, would that have effect, Would that have detected the backdoor uh, DSL log file? The integrity checker tool, and I want to make it like really clear that it was never designed as a as a full, fully functioning security product, right? It wasn't there to give 100% assurance. It was more of a debugging tool that was in place that could be used and was detecting certain aspects that modified and created files. Right. Um, so, so, so it, it wasn't was, developed in response to this incident? It was already existing. Um, there were a notable, there were a number of issues that we managed to solve around, you know, what does it actually produce and what is it saying um, is happening, but it should always have been used in conjunction with um, an investigation. So um, the ICT tool was a sort of, you know, very quick triage, but it wasn't something to give you a hundred percent yes or no answer to have I been compromised. And then if it did make detections, um, it then needed further digging into. So um, I, retrieving the logs from the system through the admin console, and then you would have had a more verbose look at what happened historically through time when files were created. And then there were aspects like getting the admin snapshots if the ICT tool had created them, all the way through to us coming and doing a full disk image, so, uh, and doing full forensics. Uh, so I'd say it had, you know, it was very useful. It, it definitely sped up some of that initial triage, but it should never have been taken you know, wholly as this is right. the answer to it right now. Um, right. And they've done they've done well in responding to it. And the reason there's an external one is because they noted, hey, there's a few issues. This, the ICT tool that was installed was never this wasn't what it was designed for. But we can add in um, some extra um, functionality and give that out so people can use it um, a bit more to get a, a get a better clearer triage. Wilfred, you you wanted to add something on this point, I think. Yeah, it was the same topic as Scott, as Scott discussed uh, about the fact, um, yeah, some campaign dropped some files, some artifacts. Uh, we saw some index text, index uh, dot text, index two, index one. Uh, we'll identify some additional variants 
of this kind of uh, backdoor. Uh, it's uh, still running today because we identified a different virus from February 13. Uh, it's uh, doing the same job, drop, not dropping the same file, uh, different name, different file type. It could be a CSS, could be a GIF, could be a text, uh, but it's the same logic by dropping the DSL backdoor. So it's still running, up up running, uh, same thread actor. Uh, so yeah, still keep running and patch your devices. Okay, thank you, Wilfried. I, I wonder if I can, Robinson, can I get, uh, I want to pose a question to you. It's sort of in the in the direction of, um, you know, how we manage this incident, um, how we prepare for, um, for, for future similar incidents. But I, I want to kind of start with a, with a simple question. This, what um, Wilfried and Scott were describing about these back doors and the different variants, I take it that's why the factory reset was important, right? To so just make sure that everything that's running on that box is um, how the, you know, how the manufacturer intended. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, correct. Uh, basically, what we have seen during the different waves of this attack is very classical web application uh, attack techniques. And indeed, um, typically dropping exfiltrating information by making it publicly accessible uh, is something that has been done for decades. For decades, uh, yeah. The guys doing mage cart attacks, um, so injecting, injecting uh, sniffers on websites, um, when it's not done in JavaScript. They also have this technique of basically grabbing credit card information and putting it into a file that everybody can access and that everybody does access. So no one knows who actually maliciously grabbed it. Right, yeah. Um, so uh, Rob, Rob, so just a technical question came into us from, from Mark Phillips, which I think would be interesting for you or, or other panelists to answer um, about uh, watching the, one of us mentioned watching these uh, compromises unfold in real time. Um, thank you, Vickers. And I know you made mention to the, of the log files, and I know you made mention of uh, network monitoring. I think um, Mark is just trying to clarify, would you be able to watch this attack unfold using what's already on the, the on the box, or, or is it something additional that would have to be deployed onto the box? On the box and on the network. Uh, Scott, go ahead. No, yeah, I, real time is a real is a real thing. You know, nothing's ever real, unless you were literally sat on a terminal hitting refresh on the on the on the on certain TCP traffic and on the files themselves. You wouldn't see it necessarily real time. There's something you can note um, within Syslog if you have that monitoring. But like um, Robinson says, it takes a defense in depth, so that's you know, network traffic or WAF firewall uh, traffic in front of it, seeing it happen, uh, not just on the appliance itself. Okay. And uh, and we didn't install anything on the appliance because we can't. Right. Um, and then there's another question, Robinson, which I think you might be interested in answering. It's it's also a little bit about how how we go forward. There's in fact two questions. The the, the one is. Uh, and I think they both allude to these reports that we've seen of old software components being used on the uh, on the Avanti devices. Um, and I think uh, Bastian asked us, uh, you know, do, do we know if they're fixing those? Um, and I think our, our comment to that is, you know, I think that's for Avanti to 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 answer. Um, but maybe a broader point is that the software version of a particular application uh, neither particularly tells us whether it's vulnerable or whether it's safe because of uh, you know com complex uh, software chaining um, and, and, and so uh, com complex software chaining and uh, and it is something that is very important for appliance vendors uh, is uh, backports yes as and backporting in, is that and, I was going to yeah. say yeah as in uh, vendors will patch in all the versions of the application with the newer security patch 
not necessarily changing, the, like incrementing the version number, because typically they only backport security and don't backport func functional patches. So it is it is a exactly. bit of a mess, certainly. Um, it is a bit of a mess, certainly. But yes, moving forward, how could one of us uh, prevent something like that happening in our organization? So we talked about defense in depth. Uh, and yes, generally, it is by exerting a larger amount of control. Uh, software bill of materials. Uh, obviously, it would be wonderful. It would be wonderful if we all had the visibility on what is inside um, these black boxes with blinking lights. In the same way, uh, and, and we saw that with Log4j, where it was a, like impossible for anyone uh, on day one of the breaking of the vulnerability to even know if they were vulnerable. Problem is, it probably won't happen. Uh, but one, like, if you have any type of weight as a customer, you can still ask for it. And if you don't, if you can't obtain a bill of materials, could ask for an audit. You could even mm. pay for it mm. and get yeah. some insight into what's happening there. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Robinson. I think you know we can't speak on Ivanti's uh, behalf as far as this uh, stuff's concerned. Uh, Nicholas on the call also asked about SBOM, so I'm glad that you you mentioned that. Um, it, it sounds to me what we're saying is you, you can't simply look at someone's dump of what versions of you know Linux software are running on a device and draw too many conclusions from that. But we we also should exercise our rights and our power as buyers to demand higher levels of transparency from from our, our vendors or higher levels of assurances just to take it at, uh, at face value. Correct. And, and then we can apply all of those layers of defense. Then we can restrict, uh, for instance, obviously tighten up like the network traffic. But like it occurred to me, if you have, like you, you, can, you can leverage a lot of things to be able to lock it down. Uh, if, for instance, you have a, I don't know, requirement uh, for uh, some systems to only be accessed uh, from the EU, for instance, because on there you have data that should not leave the EU, you could push that restriction up to anyone who has access to that system from the VPN cannot connect to the VPN outside of the EU. Mm. There, there is a lot of opportunities uh, to, in a way, justify um, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on a lot of functionalities that your network and all the products in your networks have, but are not useful to you. So here's one for you, uh, Robinson. It's from it's from Gary Taylor. It's an interesting idea. He says, what about running the external uh, integrity checker tool on a regular basis and then having it um, send alerts through to your through to your scene? Is that something that's so, being recommended as, as so the the in, I mean the the internal ICT can be scheduled to run automatically regularly uh and and that actually helped us like in a few cases uh when we say that uh the ict alone does not give information the ict alone running daily starts to give over time 
information. Mm -hmm. uh, downloading, you know, if, if scripting all of that and sending it would be awesome. Yes, it, it, it is. A, and and it sort is of keep nice it as an way, archive. But obviously, okay, well, not foolproof. Obviously, not foolproof because if a threat agent can get to the box in between two runs of that task, he can still disable it or modify it in a way that it won't return the true results. So in that Scott, sense, Scott, you had a... the difference between running internal and external is minimal, but it's still a very good idea. And, yeah. and just staying with this, I want to give uh, Scott an opportunity. He's got two more questions. The one is, do we know offhand, and I know this isn't your space, but you know whether seams have uh, kind of rules or hooks for those kinds of logs? Um, and also, is there good guidance on what to look for in syslog uh, in terms of indicators of compromise or indicators of attack? So syslog in general so i'm going to go in general and in just on the avanti device so the ict tool is absolutely right to run and it does run in, internally like Robinson says you can set it to run every two hours a lot of devices already had that running which is when i say go back and look at the logs historically we find the answers there there's a lot more than just the ict tool so that's looking for file comp uh, modifications at the file level but the applications like vpns regardless of vendor they log user access they log when they log in they log in they log the ip address they come from along with the user agent and a whole other host of information um, that should absolutely be going into a scene platform somewhere and have now when it comes to rule sets depending on the scene platform you know there's lots of different vendors there's lots of different levels of which you can pay for for certain managed services but custom rule sets over the top is 100 percent the way forward um, understanding what your logs should look like from an application level so hey i've got a vpn it's in the uk all of my users should be logging in from the uk allows you then to write rules to say tell me an alert when someone doesn't or they come from somewhere else or for whatever whatever alert logic you want to put on top but it should be being piped off into a scene platform and it's one of the things i probably and think we'll agree when we do do cases we most commonly see is hey there's not a hundred percent coverage that there are applications that are logging it's not going anywhere, not being seen by someone. That's how the detection isn't made. It's not that these things aren't in place or exist. It's that they're not configured to go anywhere and they're not being alerted on and not being looked at, which then allows you know a couple of hours, a couple of days, in some cases a couple of months for an attacker to actually do stuff before they're detected. Yeah, to 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 really stress Scott, that point, uh, all of the all of the logs from your Avanti platform should go into a scene and yeah. should be monitored. Because the fact that you, whatever type of authentication you set up, even if it's two-factor authentication, is not a guarantee your appliance will not get popped someday. Yeah. So, and, and if someone comes in with a CVE, they can, with the right privileges, create an account that does not have 2FA and connect with it to your network like mm -hmm. everybody else. So you should absolutely mm -hmm. monitor everything a security appliance does. And also be mindful when the security appliance stops sending log to your scene. Yeah. Gents, just just in the interest of time, I want to I want to push you one more time, very briefly, um, and then I want to ask. There's two more questions that I'm hoping maybe Wilfried or Vickers can help us with. Um, the uh, Gary's question was, I think, a little bit more specific about what do you look for in syslog as an indicator of compromise are there you know specific triggers processes running keywords is it ip addresses and where would you find out what what to you know how to build your your rule for specific indicators for these vulnerabilities so the the blog posts that we released they keep they have the iocs at the end the lexity and mandian also did very good blog posts uh, there's several feeds out there um, it's the, yeah. the aim is to be on the ball with knowing when they come out and, and do the active research, right? Read the papers, right. get, get those, get those, you get can information. grab the blog post uh, in the handouts of the sessions. Yes, it's in the handouts. All right, wonderful. Uh, and then I have a question uh, that I think either uh, Vickers or Wilfried uh, might be able to answer. 
I'm, I'm going to ask the first one, for this one first because it's the easiest. Um, if we're upgrading the VPN server, do we also need to upgrade the, uh, the, the client on the, on the desktop? Is there some sort of connection between them? I can answer that. No, there's no link. Uh, this is a, just a server side issue, not on client side issue. All there's right. no Thanks. need to upgrade any clients on, on people. All right, and then Wilfried, there's a much more complicated question from Adrian. Um, I don't know if you maybe saw it in the chat. He's referring to CVE 2023-41719. Um, and he says it does answer. not cover... Yeah, I answered yeah. his question, I guess. Oh, you did answer it there. Uh, uh, thank you. This, I guess I answered it uh, directly, but yeah, uh, to all people, uh, this CV is a remote code execution from uh, by a French company, Synactive. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, NRC uh, triggerable through version 9 and version 22. A fix is available on 22 only, yet. Uh, we don't know to be sure if IVNT will cover this full IPT because it's, it's not uh, very tricky to trigger this uh, remote code execution. Uh, and version 9 will be end of support uh, in the next few weeks. So it's, uh, it could be a topic to ask to IVNT, to be honest. But today, there is no fix for version 9. All right. Uh, oh, and then there's one more um, There's one more question, and I think anyone on the panel can maybe respond to this one. It's from Mark Phillips. Uh, is, there, is there a preference, physical or virtual appliance? I would say there is no security reason to go for either one. That might, and there are security gotchas in both. Like we were mentioning this while preparing this webinar, but one way we forecast this vulnerability to have a long tail is someone getting uh, in the depot and taking out a vulnerable physical appliance, plugging it in and forgetting to run the updates. But uh, an accidental restore to snapshot of a VM same. works exactly the same way. Yeah. Got you. All right, folks, we are out of our allotted time. Uh, what I'm going to ask the studio is, could we throw that uh, just in case anyone is still around and willing to answer it for us? I think it's more for our own interest than anyone else. Um, and then I'm going to ask the panelists, those of you who can, if you could stay on the line just for another five minutes, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, so for anyone who's on the call, if you have a question we haven't answered, um, then yeah, please, uh, we, we will stick around a little bit, drop your questions into the poll and we'll try and answer them for you if you can. Um, if you have to drop off, then I think all that remains is for me to say thank you very much again for your time. Sorry that We've only had an hour, but I hope it was worth your while. Um, and uh, and good luck out there to to the panelists, Vickers, Wilfried, Scott Robinson. Thanks very much, McGee in the studio. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. But um, it was a a, a chore. It was a question we asked to Ivan a few days ago. Why you didn't uh, release patches before being public? And the said. Uh, it was uh, the first goal to do, to be public with patches, but we had information about the botnet targeting massively the two first vulnerabilities from Mendiant and another security web company. And they said, okay, so we don't have the choice except to be public because it's massively exploited by botnet. So we have to go public. But yeah, I'm agreeing uh, patches with uh, the publication in the same time might be the best solution. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, Robinson was reminding us yesterday about that infamous bind vulnerability from like 2008, I think it was, that sort of made it, it Dan... It was a DNS vulnerability. Uh, DNS well, vulnerability. And so, yeah, the implementation, but one was vulnerable. Right. Yeah, and that and that was like internet apocalypse stuff. 
uh, what wasn't it Robinson and they um, sort of set the it gold was, standard for managing vulnerability disclosures universally yeah the, the, there was a potential for uh, for like complete mayhem on the internet and it was at the time uh, Dan Kaminsky who discovered the vulnerability and coordinated the response uh, to make sure that the patches would arrive in the internet infrastructure before the vulnerability goes public. So it is super interesting to learn that basically Ivanti uh, got bad luck and was caught up by a massive public exploitation before being able to coordinate any, any further response. Um, thanks, Robson. I'd like to come back to that point, but there's a question just come in from uh, from Michael Koch. See if I can yep. phrase it for you. Um, it says uh, it looks to him that without the mitigation, oh, yeah. yes, not, for sure. If you see that question, we just repeat it so that everyone yes. can hear it. Not all yes. so, unlocked URLs so, um, are logged on the appliance. So, um, it's it's about an an authenticated activity on the appliance. And mm -hmm. yes, it is correct. Uh, prior to uh, the patches, by default, there was almost nothing logged uh, for a publicly exposed, unauthenticated activity. Right. So just to be clear, Robinson, just before, before you go on, so, so somebody hits that URL via the web, if you don't have to be authenticated or if you're not authenticated, then that request is not being logged. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And that possibly makes it the, possibly the result of a consideration of uh, because this thing is publicly exposed and without authentication, we will see a lot of noise in there. And since we are on an appliance and we don't know if the logs are exported or not, we'd rather not store the logs, the logs that are noisier. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that compromise didn't work in this case. Right. And, and has that simple. changed now with the patches, or is that still the case? You had to manually, um, you have to, you, had, you could go in and turn on no off logging, and you could have done it before the patch. It's just right. it was turned off by default. Right. It's, it also leads on to the how it, why it's quite interesting when we're doing these investigations of how we're able to draw conclusions. So someone will say, well, when was the first time someone made one of these requests? Right? When was the initial compromise? Since you don't have that information, you have to go and look at, well, we know that if someone sent one of these no off authentications and it was and it was crafted correctly, that it would have taken actions on the box. So can we go and find evidence of those actions being taken at a certain time? So, you know, if they were sending these no off requests and, and writing into web shells, the fact that there's a web shell there means that that no offer, that, that request was made, right? It didn't just turn up. So um, it was one of the tricky mm. things during these investigations to actually make a um, a complete and whole timeline where large parts of evidence were missing. But we could sum we we could un, you know through the through the through the process of elimination, we were able to determine you know, what went on due to other factors around the box, but also left a lot of holes that we couldn't answer um, um, at times. So Scott, while I've got you on the line, um, the, the the poll is interesting, and maybe we can just end end on this. Poll is interesting, so it suggests uh, sixty two percent of people uh, managed to patch before they were really exposed, um, which means that maybe the disclosure wasn't as uh, as bad as all that. Um, but then there's a twenty six percent. Um, that says they were exposed but not impacted. Um, and I wonder if on a, on a parting note, we can just talk about impact. So if you were vulnerable on the internet after the disclosure on 10th of January um, and, you, and you didn't patch you know, within a few days, what, it, what is the implications for you, for you as an Avanti client? So this is where I think we spoke about yesterday in Robinson, We'll, I think agree and jump in as well, but the level of impact, uh, being being vulnerable is one thing, being vulnerable and being exploited is another, and then being vulnerable and have further, further, further exploitation that leads to an impact um, is a third thing. So 
everyone was vulnerable. I think, or oh, say everyone, all the all all the appliance versions that were that were were vulnerable that were exposed, and we know there were almost thousands of them. Um, those that got exploited, and the campaign that we identified, and the initial campaigns, um, they were automated, so that was also a lot of them. But then. Did an attacker actually come onto your appliance and then take further actions outside of that initial exploitation? That was the tricky question to say, hey, we could see a web shell got put on, but everyone had a web shell put on, um, or, or vast numbers had a web shell put on. Did someone then use that web shell to take further actions? That was where I think Manor Robinson's teams were sitting and uh, answer that question. And then if it's a yes, that's where we really kick in and start um, doing the instant response. But that's a much um, that's a much more difficult question to answer then. Uh, that once it starts going outside of a single appliance into a network, it's how big's the network, what logging have you got in place? There's lots of variables to change the, the size of a response. Um, but I, 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 I think those statistics that we're seeing are probably correct for the audience. Bear in mind that, you know, if you're if you're tuned into this and you've been keeping up to date and patching up to date, you're playing that numbers game where so many devices, there were too many devices for a number of threat actors that knew what they could do. Um, so you're in. There. I was going to say, uh, I was going to say, uh, I'm quite uh, happy for our audience um, to not have suffered uh, a wider compromise than that. It is probably um, uh, sampling bias uh, because people who are here today are very concerned with security. Yeah, and if you did have a wider compromise, you're probably not joining webinars right now. <laughs> you probably have other problems to deal with. Um, Scott, sorry, I, I just want to I just want to stay on that that green bar, the 26 percent uh, where it was exposed yeah. but not impacted, and make sure I understand this. Would you say to people who have the, the vulnerable versions and had a window of exposure, would would it be sane to recommend look factory reset anyway, just in case there's a you know that that there was a compromise in a backdoor? Yes, I think uh, the, the official advice is to do factory resets regardless during those times. Um, the using Avanti exposed but not impacted is using Avanti, the vulnerability came out. We know on very specific times when the automated exploitation took place um, because we could see it across the devices we managed, hundreds of them. So we knew it that, you know, within that 20 minute, that scanner, that automated attack that's gone out and injected this back door or, or that web shell happened at that time. When we, with the clients at least that we helped, almost all of them, um, if they didn't have signs, uh, and there would be IOCs, there'd be other tools, there would have been alerts from internal um, that something had happened. If they didn't have that, then they're essentially, and most of them patched in time as well. So it was a 24 hour, 12 hour window um, in which they were putting the patch on and then doing the factory reset and taking the right mitigation actions. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I, you know, we didn't share these stats, but um, our vulnerability management teams had run the ICT tool on half of our customers within the first day yeah. um, and the rest within less than two working days. Our stats were that uh, within that time, less than half of the assets that, sorry, less than half a percent of the assets that we managed were, were, were compromised. Um, so that's, I mean, that, so, so you know, the, the poll results, I guess, in that sense, also not entirely surprising. Yeah. Um, folks, I think it's a quarter past the hour, um, out of respect for everyone's time. I think let's, let's call it there. Once again, just to say thank you very much to the panel. Thanks for your effort. Thanks for your effort in managing this crisis. Um, to those of you who did find the time to join us on the webinar, we always appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for your support also. Uh, if you have further questions, please reach out. We'll be happy to answer them as best as we can. Um, and otherwise, have a have a great rest of the week and speak to you again soon. Hopefully, not when there's another crisis. Yeah, have a great rest of the week. Stay safe out there. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, guys.